Our objectives in this lesson are the following. Illustrate the central limit theorem. Understand the behavior of central limit theorem. And solve for the mean and standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the sample means. Let's have a quick review of our previous lesson. Determine the given in the following situations and write the formula to be used to compute for the standard error of the mean. Number one. Mrs. Cruz administered a summative exam in statistics and probability. The population mean is 32. She randomly selected 50 students and obtained a mean of 30 and a standard deviation of 4. So we have here the population mean mu is equal to 32. Randomly selected 50 students, so the sample size n is equal to 50. Obtain a mean of 30 referring to the sample, so sample mean is 30. And a standard deviation of 4 also referring to the sample, so sample standard deviation is equal to 4. Since we have the S and the N, then the standard error formula to be used is S divided by square root of N. Number 2. A population is composed of 25 items and its variance is 2.5. A sample of 15 were randomly selected and its variance is 3. We have here the population size, capital N, is equal to 25. The variance of the population is equal to 2.5. Sample of 15, so sample size of 15. And the variance is 3, which is referring to the sample s squared is equal to 3. Since we have here the population variance, taking the square root, we could have the population standard deviation. And we also have the n. So the standard error formula to be used is sigma divided by square root of n. Let's investigate. Today you will be an investigator. Remember our experiment, rolling a fair die once? We have six possible outcomes there. One, two, three, four, five, six. The six faces of a die. We computed for the mean, and the mean is 3.5. We also computed for the variance and the standard deviation. We also created the histogram. And it is a uniform distribution because every element has an equal chance of being selected. They have the equal probability. Now, I assume that I roll a die 10 times. I generated random numbers in Excel for this experiment. I computed for the mean and my sample mean is equal to 3.2. If you will do this, there is a big chance that we won't have the same result. Because like what I've said, these numbers are randomly generated. And then, I created its histogram. Since I only have one mean, I only have one bar. There is nothing really interesting here, right? That is why I generated more random numbers. This time, I generated 10 sets of of 10 random numbers from 1 to 6, the faces of a die. 10 here is my sample size. And 10 here is the number of sets. I computed for the mean of each set. These are all my sample means because these are my samples per set. And then I solved for the mean of the sample means. And I got 3.32. When I created the histogram, viola, here it is. It is much interesting than the first one, right? I continued generating random numbers. This time, I made my sample 30 and for 200 sets. The mean of my sample means is 3.48. And here is the histogram. I did not stop here. I made my sample 50 is still for 200 sets. The mean of my sample means is 3.5. And here is the histogram. For the last time in this experiment, I made my sample size equal to 100 for 200 sets. The mean of all sample means is still 3.5. And here is the histogram. Now, let us combine all the histograms and let's investigate. 
what you observe in the histogram as I increase the number of my sample size. It is becoming more of a bell shape, meaning as n increases, it approaches normal distribution. Amazing, right? Now, let's focus our attention on the means. Let us recall that our population mean is 3.5. As I increase the sample size, the mean of the sample means approaches 3.52. In fact, here it is already 3.5. It is because we have learned from our previous lesson that the mean of the sampling distribution of the sample means is equal to the population mean. We were able to prove that in this experiment. This is the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem states that given a population with mean mu and standard deviation sigma and taking sufficiently large random samples with replacement from this population, the sampling distribution of the sample means will be approximately normally distributed. And we saw that in our experiment. When we took sufficiently large random samples, the sample means becomes more normally distributed. But how large is sufficiently large? As a rule of thumb, sample sizes of n greater than or equal to 30 are considered sufficiently large. What else CLT tells us? We already know that as the sample size increases, the sampling distribution of the sample means approaches a normal distribution. Let's continue. Regardless of the shape of the original population distribution, what do we mean by this? If the population is normally distributed, then the sampling distribution of the sample means is also normal. But what if the population is not normally distributed or you don't know the nature of the distribution? It says here, regardless of the shape of the original population distribution. So, whether the population is normal or uniform like our experiment in rolling a fair die once or is skewed, meaning leaning on one side, it could be on the left or on the right, or totally random at all, the sampling distribution of the sample means will still approach a normal distribution. Here's more. The sampling distribution of the sample means gets narrower as the sample size increases. Let's recall our last three pictures because here we have sufficiently large random samples. When my n is equal to 30, the range of the sample means is from 2.67 to beyond 4.17. When my sample size is equal to 50, the range of my sample means is from 2.98 to 4.08 narrower than 2.67 to 4.17. When my sample size is equal to 100, the range of my sample means is from 3.02 to 3.95, narrower than 2.98 to 4.08. So as the sample size increases, the spread of the distribution is getting narrower. Why? Because the means is getting more concentrated in the center. Some things to remember about CLT. The mean of the sample means is equal to the population mean. We have already proven this in our previous lesson and we saw this in our experiment today. The variance of the sample means is equal to the population variance divided by the sample size. In symbol, the variance of the sample means is equal to the variance of the population divided by the sample size. And the standard deviation of the sample means is equal to the standard deviation of the population divided by the square root of the sample size. This actually 
came from here. When you take the square root of the variance, that will become the standard deviation. So taking the square root of the variance of the sample means is the standard deviation of the sample means. Taking the square root of the population variance is the population standard deviation. And taking the square root of this is a square root of n. Also, from our previous lesson, as the sample size increases, the standard deviation of the sample means or the standard error of the mean decreases. You saw this earlier when I discussed the spread of the sampling distribution. As n increases, the spread gets narrower. That is the standard deviation. The standard deviation decreases as n increases. Now, what is the importance of central limit theorem? Since most of the population parameters are unavailable, by getting several samples that are sufficiently large, we can create sampling distributions of the sample means that we can use to make assumptions about population parameters. Let us do extra challenge. You randomly draw an infinite number of samples of 10 subjects from a population. Calculate the mean for each sample and plot the sample means, just like what we did in our experiment. The distribution that you obtain from plotting sample means is called the standard error of the means, sample error of the estimate, sampling distribution of the means, or sample means normal distribution. The correct answer is sampling distribution of the means. Number two, which of these statements is true? The central limit theorem gives the exact probability of estimating the true mean. The central limit theorem only applies when the population distribution is normal. The central limit theorem requires that all samples are randomly selected from a single population. And the range of values for the sampling distribution of means is larger than the range of scores in the population. The correct answer here is, the central limit theorem requires that all samples are randomly selected from a single population. The central limit theorem does not give us the probability. And it is not only applicable in normal distribution. Like what I discussed earlier, the population distribution could be normal, uniform, skewed, or totally random at all. And the range of values in the sampling distribution is narrower, not larger, than the range of scores in the population. Number three, the central limit theorem states that the mean of the sampling distribution of the sample means is larger than the population mean, exactly equal to the population mean, close to the population mean if the sample size is large, equal to the population mean divided by the square root of the sample size. The correct answer here is exactly equal to the population mean. The mean of the sampling distribution of the sample means is equal to the population mean. Number four, if the mean of the sampling distribution of the means is 5.8, which of the following statements is true about the population mean? Letter A, the population is less than 5.8. Letter B, the population is increasing by 5.8. Letter C, the population mean is equal to 5.8. And letter D, the population mean and mean of the sampling distribution of the sample means are incomparable. Correct answer is, the population mean is equal to 5.8. Last one, number five, which of the following is not true about central limit theorem? Letter A, the population mean and the mean of the sampling distribution of the sample means are equal. Letter B, the population variance and the variance of the sampling distribution of the sample means are equal. Letter C, CLT tells us the shape of the distribution of the means will be when we draw repeated samples from the given population. And letter D, as the sample size increases, the distribution of the sample means approaches normality. Which of the following is not true? It is letter B. The population, variance, and the variance of the sampling distribution of the sample means are equal. They are not. For the summary, here are the things that we discussed in this video lesson. 
Now it is time to check your understanding. Pause this video for more time. Let us answer, determine the mean and standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the sample means. We are given the population mean, the sample size, and the population variance. For the mean of the sampling distribution of the sample means, this is just equal to the population mean. So this is also 12. Now, for the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the sample means, we simply have to take the square root of the population variance divided by the square root of our n. And this is equal to 0 0.5. So this one is also equal to 5. And this will be equal to the square root of 6 divided by the square root of 38. And this is equal to 0 0.3974. Gets? Our next lesson is solving problems involving sampling distribution of the sample means. 